Hi, thank you so much for joining me for another lecture in intergenerational mobility. I'm very excited about what we're doing today because today is moving is the beginning of a new unit focusing on discrimination. So up until now, when we've tried to understand social mobility, we've thought about the role that families and communities play primarily in low income communities, right? So we've thought about when will poor families invest more or less in their children and what role does social conformity or social norms in low income communities play in either promoting mobility or in limiting social mobility. But there's lots of reasons to think that the role that high income or dominant or rich communities play is just as important in trying to understand social mobility. In other words, we don't just want to think about the role that culture plays in either helping or hurting, poor, you know, the, the culture of low income communities plays in either helping or hurting low income children as they develop. We also want to think about the role that social exclusion among high income communities plays in maintaining social inequities, right? So we want to think about when will people in positions of power in society, members of majority groups, uh, members of dominant cultures, right, members with, uh, of, of affluent subcultures, include members of you know, historically disenfranchised people, and when will they exclude them? We're going to do this in two ways. First, we're going to work through a series of, of economic theories trying to understand where discrimination comes from and the role that discrimination plays in labor markets. And then we're going to look at some empirical evidence trying to cap measure the extent to which discrimination plays a role in the U.S. labor market in particular. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing with the unit. What we're going to be doing with today's lecture is we're going to be working through a series of theories developed by Gary Becker to understand discrimination in the labor market. These theories were developed in the 1950s, actually as part of his PhD thesis, which is um, incredible. And they've really formed the, the basis of all subsequent work trying to understand the economics of discrimination. These theories were really the first time that anyone tried to use economic theory to understand social phenomena like discrimination. And they've formed this important backbone for the future work, even the future work that's contradicted a lot of Gary Becker's predictions. So they're important for both of those reasons, right? They're important both as this historical um, underpinning to help us understand how to think about these topics using the tools of economics. They're also important because they provide these very powerfully developed, but also counterintuitive and seemingly wrong predictions. Um, and we're gonna today talk about where those predictions come from. And then in next lecture, we're gonna present a couple of other theories that provide markedly different predictions. Okay. So there's a couple things I want to say about these theories before we dive into things. The first thing is that Becker's work is really focused on trying to understand the role that prejudices play in producing or not producing labor market discrimination. So what I mean by that is when we think about prejudices, we're thinking about the perceptions, the negative perceptions or beliefs or feelings that one group of people might have towards another, right? So when we think about prejudice, We're going to think about negative perceptions of one group relative to another. So in other words, prejudices are going to be about preferences. And when we talk about discrimination, what we mean by discrimination is the actions taken by majority group members to distance themselves from minority group members or exclude minority group members. And I should really say minority group or um, disenfranchised group or underclass or something like this, because we'll include in this groups of people who might actually constitute a majority of the population, right? For example, when we think about gender discrimination, 
there are more women than men, but we're generally going to think about discrimination by men against women. So why are we making this distinction? Because we want to think about the contexts in which prejudices that exist are going to lead to discrimination, right? are going to lead to things like different employment rates or different wages for majority and minority group members. We might also want to think about situations where you might not require prejudice in order to see discrimination. So Becker's work is really coming from the perspective of saying, if we start with prejudices, if for whatever reason some members of majority group have negative perceptions of a minority group, under what circumstances will that lead to discrimination and what will the dynamics of that discrimination be? In particular, how will competitive labor markets interact with prejudices to determine discrimination? Okay, so we're, how we're going to move forward, we're going to start with a model that thinks about prejudices by employers. In other words, we're going to think about circumstances where employers of workers have some level of distaste towards hiring members of an underrepresented or minority or, or stigmatized group. Right? We'll think about this in terms of white versus non-white workers. Then we'll think about other actors in society who might have prejudices. So we'll think about what'll happen if some employees have prejudices towards other employees and what'll happen when customers have prejudices towards workers. Okay, I'll see you in the next video where we'll start talking about employer discrimination.